To begin with, on July the 20th, 1969, the world looked on in awe as 39-year-old astronaut Neil Armstrong stepped off a ladder of the lunar module Eagle and onto the surface of the moon, becoming the first human to set foot on a natural celestial object. This moment, watched on television by over 650 million people worldwide, has gone down in history as one of mankind's greatest triumphs, redefining what humanity is capable of achieving. Over the next three years, a total of six Apollo missions and 12 astronauts would visit the moon, leaving behind scientific instruments and returning mineral samples that helped expand our understanding of the moon, the Earth, and the solar system. Or so most of us have been led to believe. Despite the Apollo program being one of the largest, most expensive, and most public undertakings in human history, for nearly 60 years, a once small but ever-growing dedicated group of conspiracy theorists have maintained that the whole endeavor was in fact an elaborate hoax. A piece of Hollywood flimflamery aimed at pumping up America's self-image and winning a propaganda victory against the Soviet Union. According to this theory, no humans have ever set foot on the moon, and the famous images beamed into millions of households were instead filmed on a soundstage on Earth. While anyone with a passing knowledge of history and conspiracy should be able to recognize these claims as total nonsense, they have gained a surprising amount of traction with a 2005 poll revealing that nearly 25% of Americans aged 18 to 25 doubt that humans had ever walked on the moon. Yep. One in four, despite living in an era when humans have access to more information than ever showing that we did, in fact, land on the moon. But how did this conspiracy theory come about in the first place, and what hard observable evidence is there that the Apollo moon landings actually took place? While there were doubtless plenty of people in the 1960s who doubted that humans were capable of reaching the moon, the moon landing conspiracy theory as it exists today was started by one man named William Casing. Born in 1922 in Chicago, Casing served in the US Navy during World War II and in 1949 obtained a Bachelor of Arts from the University of Redlands in California. He then worked a variety of jobs including as a salesman, insurance claim examiner, and cabinet maker until landing a position as a technical writer for California-based aerospace company Rocket Dine. Deciding he had had enough of the rat race, in 1963, Kaysen quit Rocket Dine and traveled the country in a trailer with his family, earning a living writing books on a wide variety of topics, including cooking, farming, taxes, motorcycles, and travel. However, he maintained an active interest in the ongoing manned space program, and as the years passed, he became more and more convinced that the United States government was being less than honest about the nation's spaceflight accomplishments. In 1976, four years after the Apollo program ended, Casing, propping himself up as an expert thanks to his very brief time as a technical writer for Rocketdyne, laid out his ideas in a self-published book titled We Never Landed on the Moon, America's $30 Billion Swindle. According to Casing, sometime in the late 1950s, he managed to get his hands on a top-secret NASA study examining the feasibility of landing on the moon. The report concluded, in his words, that the chance of success was something like 0.0017%. In other words, it was hopeless. Thus, when NASA announced in 1969 that Apollo 11 had successfully landed on the moon, Casing was immediately skeptical. Central to his doubts was the Apollo 1 disaster of February 21, 1967, in which a fire on the launch pad resulted in the deaths of astronauts Gus Grissom, Ed Weil, and Roger Chaffee, and set the Apollo program back by months. As Casing later explains, as late as 1967, three astronauts died in a horrendous fire on the launch pad. But as of 1969, we could suddenly perform manned flight upon manned flight with complete success. It's just against all statistical odds. According to Casing, sometime in the mid-1960s, NASA realized that it would not be able to meet former President John F. Kennedy's goal of landing a man on the moon by the end of the decade. But rather than admit defeat, NASA decided instead to fake the whole thing. To accomplish this, the astronauts were secretly removed from the Saturn V rocket just prior to launch, and the empty rocket fired into space. The astronauts were then flown to a secret soundstage on Groom Lake Air Force Base in Nevada, better known as Area 51, where the landing and spacewalk were faked for the cameras. And when it came time for the astronauts to return to Earth, they were packed into the capsule, flown over the Pacific Ocean in a military transport plane, and parachuted into the water for the US Navy to recover. Casing never revealed which secret report he read contained the infamous 0.0017% probability of success, nor how NASA came up with such an incredibly precise figure. Indeed, there is no evidence that NASA conducted any sort of moon landing feasibility study in the 1950s, the agency only having been established in its modern form in July 1958. But, 
As we shall see, this is far from the largest gap or the most ridiculous claim in Casings' theories. For example, when asked why NASA would bother with such an elaborate charade, Casing claimed, without any concrete evidence to support it, that the agency was working with the Defense Intelligence Agency to deceive the Soviet Union and claim a major propaganda victory. He also accused NASA and major aerospace companies of going along with the scheme in order to secure lucrative government contracts, stating they, both NASA and Rocketdyne, wanted the money to keep pouring in. I've worked in aerospace long enough to know that's their goal. As for how NASA managed to dupe the Soviets when the latter were closely monitoring all American spacecraft launches, Casing had an equally simple answer. NASA simply broadcast fake signals to full ground stations into thinking a spacecraft was on its way to the moon. How exactly this was accomplished, Casing never specified. Moving on from there, in his book, Casing claims that the faked moon landings were taped live, with only a seven-second delay between recording and broadcast. This meant that if a fly were to buzz across the soundstage, the recording technicians would have only seconds to react and avoid giving away the whole charade. And just how did Neil Armstrong, Buzz Aldrin, and Michael Collins spend their free time in between filming sessions? Well, according to Casing, they flew to Las Vegas, rented a room at the Sands Hotel, and hung out at casinos and strip clubs. Casing even claims that the astronauts had such a good time in Vegas that one of them, allegedly Buzz Aldrin, got into a fist fight over a stripper, and the three could only be lured back to Area 51 for filming by providing them with buxom showgirls, and we really are not making this up cheese sandwiches. No matter what objections were leveled at his theories, Casing always had ready answers, albeit ones devoid of any supporting evidence. For example, when asked where the moon rocks the astronauts collected came from, Casing claimed they were either meteorites recovered from Antarctica or fakes created in a NASA geology lab. But what neither Casing nor subsequent conspiracy theorists have been able to explain away is how NASA and the US government were able to keep such a massive conspiracy under wraps. As anyone who has ever tried to keep a secret knows, the greater the number of people involved, the harder it is to stop the truth from leaking out. For your reference, at its peak, the Apollo program employed nearly half a million people nationwide, but in the five decades since the project ended, not a single one of them has come forward with credible evidence that the endeavor was an elaborate sham. Always one with a ready answer, Casing claims that NASA NASA only let those who needed to know that the project was a hoax, while letting everyone else believe that their work, you know, the work that, if complete to the satisfaction of the countless scientists and engineers involved ignorance of the conspiracy, would in fact allow a man to walk on the moon, was genuine. Anyone who did know of the hoax that threatened to spill the beans was either paid off, promoted, threatened, or in certain cases, murdered. Despite the sheer absurdity of his claims and the fact that his book was hardly a bestseller, Casing's writing soon gained a small but dedicated following and laid the groundwork for the thriving moon landing hoax community. Had Casing been any other man at any other time, his ideas would likely have been ignored and disappeared into history. But his experience working at Rocketdyne, brief as it was, lent his theories an air of credibility as a supposed expert, despite the fact that he wasn't even a little bit of an expert. And people ran with it. His ideas also fit perfectly into a cultural shift then taking place in America. While the 1950s and 1960s had been full of optimism about a bright technological future and celebrations of American exceptionalism, by the mid-1970s the American people had become thoroughly disillusioned with their country. The disastrous quagmire of the Vietnam War, the Watergate scandal, and the revelations about top-secret programs like MKUltra and mind control experiments caused people to lose trust in their government. With this eroded trust in those in authority, Authority, conspiracy theorists of all kinds popped up like mushrooms, which has only gotten worse and worse in the modern era, with the root cause being more or less the same on some levels. Casing's ideas were also given an unexpected boost by the 1978 film Capricorn One, written and directed by Peter Hyams. In the film, NASA, realizing that its upcoming manned mission to Mars is doomed to fail, decides to fake the whole thing instead. Just as in Casing's hypothetical Apollo scenario, the three astronauts are removed from the capsule just prior to launch, and the empty rocket is fired into space. The astronauts are then flown to a soundstage on a remote military base where the Mars landing is staged for the cameras. However, when the empty spacecraft burns up on re-entry due to a faulty heat shield, the US government decides that the astronauts must die to avoid revealing the hoax, resulting in a fraught chase across the desert. The idea for Capricorn 1 came from the same feeling of distrust for the US government that drove Casing to develop his own theories, with writer-director Hyams later musing, there was one event, Apollo 11, of really enormous importance that had almost no witnesses, and the only verification we have 
came from a TV camera. Himes went on to explain, Whenever there was something on the news about a space shuttle, they would cut to a studio in St. Louis where there was a simulation of what was going on. I grew up in the generation where my parents basically believed if it was in the newspaper it was true. That turned out to be bullshit. My generation was brought up to believe television was true and that was bullshit too. So I was watching these simulations and wondering what would happen if someone faked a whole story. In the wake of Casings, Burke, and Hyam's films, the moon landing hoax theory took on a life of its own, with others adding their own sensational details to the conspiracy. At one point, theorists determined that the moon landing sequences had been directed by none other than legendary filmmaker Stanley Kubrick for no other reason than his 2001 A Space Odyssey, released a year before Apollo 11, was one of the most realistic science fiction films ever made, featuring groundbreaking special effects. Why Kubrick would agree to help the US government perpetrate such a hoax has never been adequately explained, though most conspiracy theorists simply turn to the tried and tested excuse that he was bullied or blackmailed into it. Later theorists have speculated that Kubrick secretly confessed his involvement in the hoax via subliminal messages hidden in his 1980 horror film The Shining. These supposed clues include the infamous Room 237, allegedly meant to represent the 237,000 km average distance between the Earth and the Moon, and the Fact that in certain scenes the character of Danny Torrance wears an Apollo 11 sweater. Perhaps more than any other part of the moon landing conspiracy, this claim in particular strains credibility. After all, how could Kubrick, infamous perfectionist that he was, ever have allowed Neil Armstrong to flub his iconic line, that's one small step for a man, one giant leap for mankind. The fact that all these theories crumple so easily under the weight of the slightest scrutiny helps explain why, in 2001, Casing released an updated edition of his book titled Conspiracy Theory, Did We Land on the Moon? In this, he revises many of his claims. For example, in the first edition, Casing claims that the giant Rocketdyne F-1 engines used in the first stage of the Saturn V were discovered to be too unreliable. So NASA instead hid several H-1 rocket engines from the earlier Saturn 1B rocket inside the F-1 engine engine bells. This is one of the easiest of Casing's claims to debunk, as even a cursory look at the H-1's dimensions and performance reveal that not only could these engines not have fit inside the F-1 as Casing described, but they would not have had enough thrust to lift the Saturn V into orbit, even with the propellant tanks partially drained. Furthermore, close-up footage taken by NASA of Saturn V's lifting off clearly show the F-1 engines working just as advertised, with no smaller engine clusters in sight. Faced with such rebuttals, Casing revised his story that the F-1 engines actually did work as intended, but that the rocket was ditched in the ocean as soon as it was out of sight. Interestingly, this particular theory does contain a small grain of truth, of the type that allows successful conspiracy theories to gain traction and take off. Early in the F-1's engine development, Rocketdyne did indeed encounter serious issues with combustion instability that threatened to kill the entire Apollo program. However, through diligent trial and error, engineers, as they are wont to do for being engineers, managed to solve the problem in time, and not a single one of the 13 Saturn V's launched suffered any sort of serious failure. Other changes in the 2001 edition of Casing's book regards the role of astronauts in perpetuating the hoax. While in the 1976 edition, Casing claims that the astronauts never left the Earth and spent the entire mission hanging around in Area 51 Las Vegas, in his revised version, they actually did fly into space but remained in Earth orbit while pre-recorded footage of the landing was broadcast around the world. There's no word on whether they still had cheese sandwiches and strippers with them while circling the globe. Throughout his life, Casing continued to level various outlandish accusations at NASA, including that the Apollo 1 fire was deliberately set in order to stop astronauts Grissom, White, and Chaffee from spilling the beans on the upcoming hoax conspiracy. For those following along with Casing's narrative, this would mean that he is saying that the fire was a a deliberate action inflicted by NASA upon itself, and b an example of NASA's incompetence that forced the agency to fake the moon landings. Incredibly, Casing went even further, claiming that NASA deliberately blew up the Space Shuttle Challenger in 1986 in order to silence teacher in space. Krista McAuliffe. Why would NASA do this when McAuliffe's mission was a publicity stunt meant to rekindle public interest in space travel? Well, according to Casing, Krista McAuliffe, the only civilian and only woman aboard, refused to go along with the lie that you couldn't see stars in space. So they blew her up, along with six other people, to keep that lie under wraps. Adding to the long list of Casing's claims that are ridiculously easy to debunk, it is worth pointing out that Krista McAuliffe was not the only woman on board. NASA astronaut Judith Resnick was 
also killed in that tragedy. Given these outrageous accusations, it's no surprise that Casing and his followers have run afoul of several astronauts and other NASA personnel. For example, in 1996, Apollo 8 and 13 astronaut Jim Lovell publicly stated, This guy is wacky. His position makes me feel angry. We spent a lot of time getting ready to go to the moon. We spent a lot of money. We took great risks. And it's something everybody in this country should be proud of. Lovell also wrote to Casing, asking him to tear up your manuscript and pursue a project that has some meaning. Leave a legacy you can be proud of, not some trash whose readers will doubt your sanity. In response, Casing proceeded to sue Lovell for slander and defamation. However, the case was ultimately thrown out of court and nothing came of the affair. Understandably, Casing's death in 2005 at the age of 83 was met with mixed feelings by those who had participated in the Apollo program, with few managing to muster much sympathy for a man who accused NASA of multiple murders. More recently, on September the 9th, 2002, 37-year-old cab driver, conspiracy theorist, and documentary filmmaker Bart Sibrel invited Apollo 11 astronaut Buzz Aldrin at the Beverly Hills Hotel under the pretense of filming a children's TV show on space. When Aldrin arrived at the hotel, Sibrel and his camera crew ambushed him, with Sibrel attempting to make Aldrin swear on a Bible that he had walked on the moon. Sibrel then proceeded to call Aldrin a liar and a coward, at which point, in a moment that doubtless elicited cheers throughout the space exploration community, the 72-year-old astronaut proceeded to punch Sibrel right in the face.